If there is one thing about the Soviet Union that everyone has heard about, it's the Great Purge. Now, the typical belief is that Joseph Stalin initiated mass terror in order to consolidate his power from those who disagreed with him and to sow fear among the populace in order to create obedience to his totalitarian state. The so-called evidence of this account is mainly based upon rumors and hearsay and parroted from those with the direct goal of defaming communism. The professional anti-communist propagandist Robert Conquest even admitted this. And by the way, that's not an insult. Conquest's job for the British government was literally spreading anti-communist propaganda. Anyway, Conquest thinks that rumor is the best source for political matters. Just like rumors said that Obamacare was going to force microchips on everyone and that Russia hacked the US election, along with other absurd rumors. So obviously, rumor is not good evidence whatsoever. A rumor doesn't care about truth. It gets spread because it's sensational. The absurdity of the rumor is precisely why it becomes popular and spread. The anti-communists are just clearly grasping at anything which remotely supports their assertions. Instead of writing history on things that someone's cousin's former roommate's wife said, we should look towards actual contemporary eyewitness accounts and primary source documents. Now these source documents are now available to us and they have been the subject of much study. So too do we have first-hand eyewitnesses. But before we can get into any of this and what they show, let's investigate the reasons and motives of the purge. So this notion that Stalin was behind the purge to rid opposition is actually quite difficult to believe because the opposition never had any mass support. That Stalin had the party membership solidly behind him in this controversy with Trotsky and his group is shown by a 1927 party referendum in which the Trotskyist program was defeated by 725,000 votes to 6,000. In view of Trotsky's contentions, the vote is surprising in showing how tiny the opposition forces were in reality. The author of the book Comrade X, Grigory Tokev, was a member of an opposition group, and he states that not one oppositionist group had proved capable of preparing in good time, as an alternative to the party's general line, a program sufficiently revolutionary to capture the sympathy of the masses. So the opposition was pretty tiny, and it wasn't much of an actual fair political threat. Furthermore, the members of the opposition were actually allowed back into the party a number of times, and they were actually allowed into important political positions. Bukharin, for example, was placed back into his position as editor of one of the major newspapers at the time. And Zinoviev and Kamenev were kicked out of the party several times, yet they were still readmitted. Why exactly would Stalin allow this? Why would he allow them back into the party if they threatened his power? Furthermore, Stalin tried to step down from his post of general secretary a total of four times, why would he threaten his power like this if he wished to consolidate it? There is also the idea that Stalin just purged anyone and everyone who disagreed with him. And this is still clearly wrong. Molotov frequently disagreed with him, yet he wasn't chilled. Same goes with Voroshilov and Mikoyan. Marshal Zhukov, who worked closely with Stalin, stated, By the way, as I was convinced during the war, J.V. Stalin was not at all the kind of man before whom one could not post sharp questions, and with whom one could not argue, and even defend one's point of view. If someone says differently, then I tell you directly. Their affirmations are not truthful. And Khrushchev, who is clearly anti-Stalin, himself actually agreed with this. And here is something interesting, which was also characteristic of Stalin. This man in a flare-up of anger could do a lot of harm, but when you demonstrated to him that you were right, if you abducted good facts, he would understand in the end that this was a man who was defending a useful cause and would support you. Yes, there were cases when you could firmly disagree with him, and if he was convinced you were right, then he would yield his own point of view and take the point of view of his interlocutor. So the opposition didn't actually exist in any sort of fair political sense. That is, pose an actual non-violent political threat backed by the masses. The only way for them to actually pose a threat is if it existed in an insurrectionary sense. So this begs the question, did there really exist an active resistance within the Soviet Union that needed to be rooted out? Well, before looking at the Soviet Union, it must be realized that in any sort of political change, there almost always exists an opposition that seeks to resist said change. This is regardless of ideology or what kind of change it is. In the American Revolution, for example, many loyalists were harassed and repressed. Thomas Allen's book, 
fighting for the king in America's first civil war details multiple cases of opposition forcing 5% of the white population to flee to Canada or back to England. Later on, the government enacted the Sedition Act, which violated the First Amendment by censoring the press. The French Revolution also utilized the same tactics. Historian Howard Brown lists several cases of the French state using the military to disperse illegal gatherings, seize criminals, and fight banditry, siege towns, and patrol the countryside. And President Lincoln also did this during the American Civil War with the suspension of habeas corpus, which essentially denies the rights of political prisoners. And of course, there were the Palmer Raids where the US government repressed suspected leftists. These were responses to fragile material conditions that exist after a change in the political structure of the society. So naturally, the same would happen within the Soviet Union. So how real was the insurrectionary opposition? Clearly, after the revolution, there would still exist a number of ex czars and bourgeois they're not just gonna lie down and cry and just accept change. Take the case of Boris Bajanov. He was able to become Stalin's personal assistant. Yet he outright claimed after he defected, he intended to embed himself within the party and overthrow socialism within Russia. The Bolsheviks seized it in 1919, sowing terror. To spit at them in their face would have only given me 10 bullets. I took another path. To save the elite of my city, I covered myself with the mask of communist ideology. Starting in 1920, the open struggle against the Bolshevik plague ended. The fight against it from outside had become impossible. It had to be mined from within. A Trojan horse had to be infiltrated into the communist fortress. And there was also the case of George Solomon. Now Solomon held the Menshevik belief that the bourgeoisie was destined still to bring us many positive elements. This class needed to fulfill its historic and civilizing role. Should we not, in the interest of the people that we wanted to serve, give the Soviets our support and experience? in order to bring this task some sane elements? Would we not have a better chance to fight against this policy of general destruction that marked the Bolsheviks activity? We could oppose the total destruction of the bourgeoisie. Clearly, the enemies of the Soviet Union are going to attempt to use anything at their disposal to disrupt the building of socialism. Many engineers from America were sent to aid in their industrialization efforts. John Littlepage was one of these engineers and he observed a number of industrial sabotage. One day in 1928, I went into a power station at the Kutch Bar gold mines. I just happened to drop my hand hand on one of the main bearings of a large diesel engine as I walked by and felt something gritty in the oil. I had the engine stopped immediately and we removed from the oil reserve about two pints of quartz sand, which could have been placed there only by design. On several other occasions, in the new milling plants at Coach Car, we found sand inside such equipment as speed reducers, which are essentially enclosed and can be reached only by removing the handhold covers. Such petty industrial sabotage was, and still is, so common in all branches of Soviet industry that Russian engineers can do little about it, and were surprised at my own concern when I first encountered it. He also observed similar sabotage happening in the Urals. Basically, he writes that he arrived at the Urals and pretty much everything he was trying to do was just tied down by bureaucratic red tape. Every recommendation that he made was just completely ignored. The Russian engineers were incredibly sullen and obstructive. He states that the mining methods used were so obviously wrong that a first year engineering student could have pointed out most of their faults. A new manager had come onto the workplace and basically got the engineers to go along with his suggestions. And at the end of five months, I decided I could safely leave this property. Mines and plant had been thoroughly reorganized. There seemed to be no good reason why production could not be maintained at the highly satisfactory rate we established. In the spring of 1932, soon after my return to Moscow, I was informed that the copper mines at Kalta were in very bad condition. Production had fallen even lower than it was before I had reorganized the mines in the previous year. Then one day I discovered the new manager was secretly countermanding almost every order I gave. In short time, the mine manager and some of the engineers were put on trial for sabotage. I was satisfied at the time that there was something bigger in all this than the little group of men at Kalta. He also recounts similar events in Kazakhstan, but mere industrial sabotage was only one goal that these counter-revolutionary opposition groups were using. They actually resorted to outright assassination attempts on leading party members. <laughs> Мы, комиссар Любовицкий, Павел Смирнов, был начальник, провожали их на Ленинградский вокзал. Кирова и Сталина. Сталин провожал Кирова там. Тепло с ним попрощался, обнял его, понимаете, так. И они попрощались, и Киров поехал в Ленинград. А через день, через полтора его... 
Colonel Grigory Tokiv was a Bolshevik cadre and aeronautical engineer who defected the Britain shortly after World War II. He wrote an account of his involvement in a clandestine counter-revolutionary group to which he belonged since the early 1920s. An organization which claims the enemy of any man who thought to divide the world into us and them into communists and anti-communists. He stated that in his clandestine meetings, talks of assassination were commonplace and even talked about calmly. He also writes that the leader of this group, Comrade X, considered an assassination attempt on Stalin, yet decided it wasn't the right time because he pointed out that there had already been no less than 15 attempts to assassinate Stalin. None had ever gotten near to success. Each had cost many brave lives. Now there is much, much more information regarding the opposition and counter-revolutionary elements. Suffice to say, there is just a ton of evidence to demonstrate that real, fifth column, counter-revolutionary groups existed within the Soviet Union in an attempt to overthrow the proletarian state. Now there is more I could go into, however, I would like to actually get to the purges themselves. Basically, what I've shown is that the purges were not optional, they were necessary. As Stalin said, to disarm the revolution without having any guarantees that the enemies of the revolution will be disarmed, would that not be folly? Would not that be a crime against the working class? In regards to the purges themselves, what exactly went wrong? Because we hear all these stories about these atrocities committed during the purge, so who exactly is to blame? The anti-communists have this view of Stalin as an omniscient, omnipotent entity who controlled every single thing, and that the purges were the only thing on his mind. Now this ignores that a lot was happening in the 30s which took up Stalin's time, along with other state officials. It is impossible for them to play detective in the streets hunting counter-revolutionary elements at all times. This means there was a need for delegation. Molotov says, we cannot pause in the 1930s to go into a person's record thoroughly and get the objective facts about him. We did not have the time or resources to defer action. Much of the purges were in the hands of the NKVD, which became riddled with corruption and chaos, acting against the party's wishes. As such, there existed multiple groups within the USSR attempting to use this repression for their own gain. Historians Getty and Namov admit, the terror was a series of group efforts, though the groups changed frequently. Rather than a matter of one man intimidating everyone else, if we set aside the notion of a grand Stalin plan to kill everyone, the evidence for which, aside from knowing the end and reading backward, is quite weak, it is possible to understand the politics of the 1930s as an evolving political history in which self-interested persons and groups jockeyed for position. Given that local authorities decided how many would be repressed, who would live, and who would die, it is difficult to agree that everything was planned and administered from Moscow. Another historian, Ritterspurn, who, like Getty, carried out massive studies on official archive data, agree. Similarly, the fact that police action of 1932 continued for so long in company with equally self-contradictory political acts makes it unlikely that we are dealing with a victorious punitive expedition being carried through by the Praetorian Guard of an all-powerful dictator. So too does another historian who has also studied the archive data agree neither the beginning of, the course of, nor the end of the terror shows the hand of a master planner. And these historians are not communists, nor are they pro-Stalin. They just merely recognize that history is not so black and white. Now the actual head of the NKVD, Yezov, himself promoted and worked within such chaos. He forged documents, forced confessions, and contradicted state directives. He was actually the one who requested a reinstatement of the Troikas in 1937. As Edgar Snow says, he essentially ran a state within a state. Getty also talks about secret meetings in which Yezov would advocate for disobeying the legal restrictions placed upon repressions. A very anti-Stalin researcher, Kastov, also acknowledged the fact that Stalin was being deceived by the members of the NKVD. Now the question is, did Stalin actually strive to investigate the NKVD? Well, actually, yes. Stalin did strive to undergo audits of the NKVD. The Central Committee set up a commission to investigate possible corruption. Once sufficient evidence was discovered, Stalin removed Yezov, disavowed the latter's excessives, ordered the arrest of the perjurers, and released a number of those falsely arrested. And Yezov was questioned and executed for his crimes. Yezov confessed to being an agent of Germany who had plans to carry out a coup against the Soviet Union. Now, my I know many will probably think the confession was forced, however, his confession was not released until the archives were open. Many had no idea that Yezov was actually executed in the first place. Many thought that he was hauled off to a mental institution. Anti-Stalin historian Roy Medvedev states that Yezov complied during the rest and was not tortured. So clearly, 
The typical conception of the Great Terror is extremely flawed. It was not some omnipotent dictator who was dictating the purges to sow mass terror, but was carried out on a local level, spearheaded by Yezov, and infiltrated with a lot of anti-communist corruption. Now, another thing to mention about the purges is that the estimates of those who were repressed are extremely wrong. Due to the archives being released, we know that the extremely high number in the millions that people like Robert Conquest talk about are absolutely false. The vast majority of the population were also not targeted. Terror touched a minority of citizens, albeit a substantial one, and the violence was concentrated among the country's elite. Many citizens, however, did not experience or even notice the terror except in newspapers or speeches. And by the way, the whole concept of ruling by terror really makes no sense. The USSR was a country built by revolutionaries, and the state consisted of a tiny minority of the population. Thurston estimates that police and military forces during the purges consisted of about 0.2% of the population. It's quite hard to believe that they were able to maintain power for all these years through mass terror and repression. And Stalin himself makes a really good point about rule by terror. Do you really believe that we could have retained power and have had the backing of the vast masses for 14 years by methods of intimidation and terrorization? No, that is impossible. The Tsarist government excelled all others in knowing how to intimidate. It had long and vast experience in that sphere. Yet in spite of that experience, and in spite of the help of the European bourgeoisie, the policy of intimidation led to the downfall of Tsarism. Besides, our workmen have three revolutions behind them, and that is sufficient practice for them to destroy any leaders they do not like. So in the end, it appears that the actual historical historical record does not match the typical conception of the purges that most people believe in Parrot. The evidence presented here confirms Stalin was not guilty of mass first degree murder in 1934 to 1941 and did not plan or carry out a systematic campaign to crush the nation.